This is the Everyday Frey Podcast, hosted by Michael Howey. Hello, friend. I'm Michael Howey, and this is the Everyday Frey Podcast. Can cuddling your pooch prevent depression? Will playing with your cat resolve your anxiety? Can swimming with the dolphins really relieve stress and improve your quality of life? The answer is, I don't have a clue. And despite sensationalized headlines, it seems that the scientific community isn't too sure either. Animal-assisted therapy is a trending subject, but what it actually looks like, and whether or not there's any scientific evidence to support it, isn't as simple as the media would have us believe. From studies with notable methodological flaws to our preconceived biases influencing our personal or anecdotal experiences, sorting out the role animals can play in our treatment is a little more complex than it would appear. One scientist examining the available evidence is Dr. Hal Herzog, a professor emeritus of psychology at Western Carolina University, popular writer of the Animals and Us blog at psychologytoday.com, and author of Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat. Reviewing studies, challenging notions about animal-assisted therapy, and putting me in my place for my misconceptions about the pharmaceutical industry is what Dr. Herzog enjoys. And that's exactly what he did during an in-depth interview with the Everyday Frey podcast. In my experience, we, we, when we talk about sort of animal assistance uh, in, in regards to any kind of therapy or, or life, uh, I'd always seen seeing eye dogs. Um, seizure response dogs, uh, hearing aid dogs even, who are all trained, very straightforward, uh, to perform a task. And it's something, you know, I, I reported on when I worked for the newspaper. It's something I've seen in action. But nowadays, we're seeing a much broader uh, assortment uh, of dogs, specifically dogs, helping people. Um, so could we start with maybe defining what these different roles are? Uh, we can we can give it a shot. It turns out that a lot of this is sort of ill-defined, uh, but we can uh, we can sort of we can give it a shot and see where some of the problems are in terms of, in terms of definition. Well, that might be part of the problem in itself, right? Uh, I know uh, right. emotional re- or emotional assistance or emotional support. Um, I believe is something that is being talked about more and more and more. So, what's the the general idea behind? an emotional support dog and how does it differ from maybe you know a a dog that's been trained to assist with uh ptsd or with uh, autism okay this is a, a very this is a fundamental difference and it's one in the united states at least which has big legal implications and let's start off with what's uh called the service animal and a service animal, uh, as you're, you're quite right, historically these started out as a guide dogs or sometimes called seeing eye dogs, uh, were expanded to hearing animals for people that were deaf, and uh, even psychiatric service animals, which uh, have a have a specific function. For example, identifying somebody that's let's say getting ready to have a panic attack, and then perhaps even nudging that person over uh, out of a, out of a uh, a, uh, a public a public situation. The critical thing about a service animal, no matter whether it's a guide dog or a psychiatric service animal, uh, is number one, that it has to be trained to perform a specific function. Number two, they are not supposed to be pets. And uh, number three, in the United States, they are restricted to dogs or, believe it or not, miniature horses. So your cat, your iguana, your tarantula cannot be a service animal. Now, on the other hand, an emotional support animal, uh, you have a different set of criteria. Uh, here, uh, it, it's an apt title because an emotional support animal does just that. It provides emotional support. So it helps you, you through the day. But it's got to do more than that. For it to be officially an emotional support animal, it, it, while it doesn't have to be trained and it can be a pet, it's got to assist you in dealing with a recognized psychiatric disorder. That is a disorder which is listed in the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, but the definition is pretty loosey-goosey. Here it can be a pet, and you, excuse me, here it can be, it can be any species, 
and it can be a pet. So it could be a dog. It could be a cat. It could be a, an iguana. Uh, it could be a boa constrictor. I feel like they may provide a different kind of support uh, that may end up being more beneficial to the boa constrictor than the person. But I may be a little biased. Um, you might be biased. There was an interesting case with a boa constrictor where the uh, a guy walked into a Walmart in Seattle with a boa, his boa constrictor uh, around his neck. And he said it was an, a seizure alert animal. And that when the uh, boa constrictor uh, perceived that he was going to be having a seizure, it would squeeze him around the neck. And he went to the Walmart, and of course, it freaked everybody out in the Walmart. And Walmart, well, Walmart kicked him out, and uh, he took them to court, uh, saying that he had a right to have this uh, seizure alert snake, and uh, he lost. <laughs> okay, I, I was going to say this, this, this. No, come on, it's sort of like the uh, when you hear about the burglar falling through the skylight and. Uh, uh, suing the homeowner. Um, right. that's, that's when your American legal system gets a little confusing. Um, and I guess sort of like this, this is where it gets complicated because this is a very complex situation. Um, when we talk about emotional support animals, and this is what I am seeing a lot of myself, both on television, on social media, and even just day to day is my dog helps me with blank. Um, and, you know, one of the ones I'll hear about frequently is my dog helps me with uh, my, and it's typically an anxiety disorder. Uh, PTSD is probably the most common one I have heard. Um, so is there, like, I and, and as you know, as listeners know, I, I have dogs. Is there some kind of recognition that these dogs can provide this? Um, you know, because clearly these people feel better with the dog there. But is this anecdotal information in any way reliable? Does it mean something? Or is it just that the dog is a comfort the way that, you know, when I was first dealing with my uh, my sort of my panic level, uh, uh, panic disorder, um, having my saddlebag with all of my, you know, my water bottle and my meds and everything in it was a comfort. Right. This is the this is where things get sort of uh, loosey-goosey and ill-defined. And, um, and it gets to the question of, uh, you know, what is emotional support? Is there a difference between an emotional support animal, for example, and a, and a therapy animal? And the pro one problem is that if you ask people, um, does your pet provide you, let's talk dogs, does your dog provide you with emotional support? What proportion of pet owners will say, yes, my dog provides me with emotional support? Nearly all of them. In fact, there was a study done by the American Veterinary, Medi uh, American Veterinary Hospital Association some years ago where they asked women uh, uh, how much emo – well, the, the survey, I forgot the exact question, but basically over half of women said that they got more emotional support from their dog than they got from their husband or their kids. I'm pretty sure my wife would agree with that. <laughs> yeah, mine might too. Yeah. Um, um, so the, the problem is, you know – all pets provide, most pets, many pets provide emotional support. Um, and we, you know, how can we separate out the sort of uh, feel good response we get from the, you know, you know, interacting with, with, with our pets with sort of a long term, term therapeutic effect. So that's, that's one issue. The other issue, which I think you're getting at is how good is the empirical evidence that emotional support animals are effective? Am I interpreting that correctly? That's what we're walking towards. That's what we're walking towards. And the answer specifically with the emotional support animals is that it's almost non-existent. Uh, much, much, much to people's surprise. We have, uh, I actually uh, did a literature search recently. I was curious about studies done specifically with emotional support animals. And for example, do they help people on on planes, let's say get through plane flights and things like that. And I and I also went online and talked to, you know, put out put out Facebook calls and Twitter calls to, you know, to researchers uh, in this field. And I said, do you know of any studies showing that emotional support animals are effective, for example, for air travel? And there have been none. So, um, you know, we can talk a little later about, you know, studies on the effectiveness of animal assisted therapy, but in terms specifically of Anim of emotional support animals, for example, even with PTSD, uh, the evidence is weak to non-existence. And that seems very surprising to me. Um, but I, as I have heard, studies regarding particularly domestic pets 
uh, are often not as common as we would expect them to be. Um, and when we do have them, there are frequently problems, uh, be it from, you know, the, the uh, uh, size of a control group to relying wholly on self-reporting. Um, so maybe we should talk a little bit about that too, is what are we missing uh, when we do talk okay. about these? Okay. Um, uh, in one sense, there, there are actually tons of studies on this. Um, but it depends, but in some areas, the studies, you're quite right. The studies are absolutely lacking. So for example, the studies on PTSD, there's very few of those. And for example, I was surprised to find that, uh, until the last year, there had been no real studies on the use of animals, uh, emotional support dogs for the treatment of uh, PTSD in, uh, in veterans in uh, in military veterans. Um, so, so even though there's been hundreds and hundreds of studies in some areas, the studies, there's really su surprisingly, surprisingly few. Um, the other problem that you mentioned is absolutely correct, which is that the studies that we do have, the vast, I, I, I feel comfortable in saying that the vast majority have very serious flaws, which compromise our ability to trust their results. And uh, you, want me, you, want, you want me to just give you a list, a, a, an initial list of problems that we see in these things? Sure. Would that be helpful? And what yeah, I'll, absolutely. I'll just sort of run down this list real quick. And I probably got a dozen things on here and then we can talk about some of them as you wish. OK, you ready? Ready? Yep. Let's start. Uh, number one, a lot of it's reliance on anecdotal evidence. That is to say, uh, you know, my dog, exactly what you're talking about. You know, my dogs help me deal with things. But that's that doesn't count in terms of, uh, you know, the normal standard of evidence we use for uh, does a medical or psychological therapy work. Um, there's one of the things that I'm very concerned is what's called the file drawer effect, which we can talk about later, which is the fact that, uh, researchers only tend to publish studies that work and they tend to not publish studies that don't work. Uh, we have very few, what are called randomized control studies. And these are what are the, called the gold standards for any kind of clinical trial, uh, where you randomly assign, uh, participants to, uh, uh a treatment condition and then a control condition. Uh, very, very often in uh, animal assisted therapy studies, there is no control group uh, for, for uh, placebo effects. And as my uh, friend uh, Lori Marinas uh, uh, titled an article recently that she wrote, she, she wrote, How Important is the Animal in Animal Assisted Therapy? So mm. when you get animal assisted therapy, let's say you're it's dolphin assisted therapy and you wind up on a uh, tropical island somewhere and get to swim with dolphins. Um, well, is it the dolphins that's having an effect improving your mood or is it the fact that you're out there in the sun and you're doing something new and, um, you know, there's a lot else going on. So, for example, if a person visits you in a, uh, a nursing home and it's a, it's, a, it's a sweet, young, enthusiastic person that's interested in talking to you and also uh, brings her dog, um, is it the interaction with you or the interaction with the dog that's creating the problems? Um, most studies in this series, another another problem that I'm very concerned with is that most studies of animal assisted therapy have what is called low statistical power. Um, that is to say they may have uh, two, three, a dozen, two dozen subjects. And uh, on average, the average number of, of uh, subjects is, is about 25 in these studies. And what this means is that um, they are underpowered statistically. Uh, so by my calculations, if the typical study has a mean of 25 subjects, we can only be about 20% confident that the results are in fact true. Um, wow. We also have, I'll, I'll go down the list, we have reliance on self-reports. We have unconscious bias on the part of researchers, most of whom are true believers in the uh, positive impact of animals. Uh, we have cherry picking of results, as to say the uh, researchers will may give 10 scales and well, uh, only five significant results on five of them, and they only report those five. Uh, we have very few studies with long-term evaluations. Um, and we have uh, biased media reporting. The media only reports only reports the studies that, uh, that, that, that work. And I've got lists of studies that didn't work that never make the media. And then there's conflicts of interest. Uh, so, for example, uh, a lot of the dolphin studies were done by people that own dolphin you know, swim with dolphins. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 
there's really a mismatch between what we actually know in terms of high quality studies about the impacts of animals on human health, including animal therapies, and what the public thinks that we know. Well, and that's that that to me is very telling, um, and it makes me think of a uh, uh, a researcher I interviewed um, who, and again, this is wildlife, which is as we all know, sort of my main focus in life. Uh, but it was looking at the quality of studies in certain journals and realizing that the quality simply wasn't there. And in very much the way you talked about doing the, the randomized control. Uh, and this is where it gets interesting to me because when we talk about that, particularly in this field of mental health, um, you know, I, I take citalopram every day for my anxiety disorder and it has been tested out the wazoo. Uh, and if they went to the FDA, if they went to Health Canada and said, here's our study, we talked to 50 people who reported on their feelings, uh, they, they'd be laughed out of the building. Why do you think it is that when we're talking about mental health in regard to pharmaceuticals, there is this expectation of extreme vigilance? But when we're then talking about mental health in regards to animals, it, it is, you know, the, the, these are flaws that I, I would wager some high school biology students could point out. Well, um, I have a disagreement with you on that. Okay. And uh, here's the disagreement. I think the pharmaceuticals, I think the data now shows that pharmaceutical studies are in many cases equally bad and have many of the same problems. Now, they do have control groups and things like, like that. But in the United States, um, to get a drug, the, the bar to getting a drug passed by the FDA is quite low. You basically have to do two studies with a couple hundred subjects each. And uh, it's and I've got data showing, and other people have published this, that studies that are funded by the pharmaceutical companies are much more likely to obtain positive results than uh, studies, drug studies that are funded by directly by, for example, the, NI, the NIH. So I think pharmaceutical, I think, and furthermore, uh, studies have studies have found uh, when you look at replication of drug studies, for example, with drugs like antidepressants, that oftentimes these uh, clinical trials don't replicate. So I think we see the same. We we I, I, I think the animal assisted therapy is tougher. Um, because it's tougher to have good control groups. It's tougher to standardize what's actually going on in the therapeutic situation. But I, th I think that you've got some of the same problems in terms of conflicts of interest, uh, in terms of inability to replicate results, uh, in terms of not knowing the mechanisms of therapies. We don't know how drugs like uh, uh, you know, antipsychotic drugs or, or you know, a lot of, a lot of the, the uh, you know, uh, anti-anxiety drugs. We don't really don't know how the, how those how those drugs work. Just like we don't know uh, how you know what's the mechanism by which uh, interacting with guinea pigs benefit uh, social interactions with autistic kids, which actually does tend to do. So I don't I'm not, I don't think I think the pharmaceutical company is actually pharmaceuticals are actually a really bad model of how to do of how to do high quality clinical research. It appears to be more scientific, but we see the same sorts of biases which is really scary by the way well you've gone and ruined my point um so let's just move on to the next subject <laughs> i'm sorry about that you can edit this out like. <laughs> that's the problem with you scientists and your silly facts uh which I actually know. and that's oh. something i wanted to bring up i uh i i heard this yesterday and i'm sure i've heard it before but it, it came up yesterday and it stuck in my head uh this was in one of my uh, uh i'm in a new cbt program and the uh, one of the uh, administrators said, uh, in talking about identifying, uh, you know, how we feel, that no one can ever tell you how you feel is wrong, but how you feel does not necessarily represent the facts around that. Um, and this this is again, absolutely. Yeah, I, this is, you know, very much sort of looking at the anxiety. So again, it's you're talking about catastrophic thoughts, talking about uh, all kinds of cognitive distortion. Um, and I would imagine when we're talking about one of the the items you brought up, the, uh, the self-reporting um, and the, the various types of bias that come into play, that is a very common issue is this is how I feel, therefore it's right, or therefore it, it makes all of this true. It makes this anecdote a fact. Uh, how do we discuss that with people uh, without 
directly insulting them because I feel at times you might almost have to. Uh, and I think the great example of that is the the dolphins, as you said. You're in a tropical location in the sun, in the water. Uh, maybe you had a couple of cocktails the day before, uh, but you assign all of it to that very limited interaction with the dolphin. Yeah, a great example of what you're talking about is it was a study done by uh, Deborah Wells. Uh, and she did a study of the, the impact of pets, uh, owning a pet. And I think it was specifically dogs on people that had tr chronic fatigue syndrome. And so she had uh, people with chronic fatigue syndrome uh, with dogs and that did not have dogs. And um, she asked them, you know, she asked them, you know, does your dog, uh, you know, sort of improve, you know, make your life better, uh, make you less depressed, alleviate your symptoms and all that. And nearly all the uh, chronic fatigue uh, syndrome uh, folks that had uh, dogs said, yes, my, these dogs, my dog's really important to me. Furthermore, it really helps me get through my day and, you know, improves my mood and you know, makes me less depressed, uh, makes me more mobile, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you also had an, a symptom checklist and people rated uh, how they're, uh, you know, how they were feeling in terms of a variety of physical and psychological symptoms. And in reality, there was absolutely no difference at all between the shockingly little difference between people that uh, that had dogs and didn't have dogs. And it, the studies, the studies of the, the impact of pets on loneliness is, are also quite interesting. Uh, people will tell you that their pets make them feel lonely, uh, less lonely. However, when you actually look at the studies, and there have been a number of studies on this, what you find is that some of the studies have found that, yes, people with pets were less lonely. Some of the studies found no difference. And then some of the studies, about the same number that said pets made people feel less lonely, found that the pet owners were actually lonelier, which in some ways makes sense. Because you might think, that well, lonely, I'm not saying the pets made them lonelier, but you might anticipate that lonely people might be more likely to get pets as a form of, of uh, you know, sort of self-therapy. So the, the data is uh, really all over the place, but I think you're quite right about, um, especially with when it comes to animals, because, uh, you know, people with pets tend to be animal lovers. Uh, we really want to believe that these animals have uh, therapeutic effects and they're good for us. And the same is true with researchers. I'm, I'm concerned about researcher bias. Um, the researchers, people go into this field uh, because they, uh, they really believe, deeply believe oftentimes that animals are good for people and that have therapeutic properties. And I worry that, that, um, that you know, that, you know that, that makes for, uh, you know, passionate research, but doesn't necessarily, that sort of a priori belief doesn't necessarily make for good science. Well, and shouldn't the, the more or less the scientific process, in addition to the, the progress or the, the process of peer review, filter out some of this? Um, you know, shouldn't we be seeing that, as the the rise in these studies occurs, that the results start to maybe streamline, or we start to see patterns emerge. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and I, I I think we are seeing some patterns emerge, and I think also in some ways the studies are getting better, and that's that's a good news. And you know, for example, here's a, here's a couple of patterns that I that I see consistently. I think we have uh, at least data enough enough research that I'm convinced that interacting with pets, but well, specifically because most of this research has been done with dogs, interacting with dogs uh, has uh, some physiological effects. For example, it lowers blood pressure. It decreases uh, cortisol levels, certain stress levels. Um, in addition to that, uh, inter and, I, and I think the evidence, the evidence is, 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 is quite good on that. However, these, these are, these are short-term effects. Um, Similarly, I think that interacting with dogs oftentimes can reduce uh, psychological stress in people and elevate elevate people's mood. Some some studies have shown this, and I think quite a lot. So if you take dogs into nursing homes, and and uh, uh, oftentimes this will in fact improve the moods and you know po positive affect, you know, to use a clinical term, of people that are interacting with those dogs. So we have we have good evidence, I think, for the for the short term both biologically and psychologically. Um, we have good evidence now, for example, that uh, some very good studies have shown that uh, bringing uh, guinea pigs into classrooms with autistic kids increases uh, social interactions in these kids. I think some of those studies are quite good. What we don't have is equivalent evidence of long-term therapeutic effects. So the evidence for short-term you know that that dog that dogs that uh, interacting with with pets uh, 
and many people produce a sort of a feel-good response, a temporary feel-good response, but that we don't have evidence that that translates into uh, long-term benefits frequently. And that's um, something that you brought up that I find very telling too, was asking about the individuals involved in the study. Um, and this is where I, I, and this is where my worlds collide and I kind of love it. Um, and I, I imagine this is probably how you felt um, when you got into sort of the, the big picture anthrozoology field as it began to emerge um, is seeing how these different components start coming together. Um, you know, in wildlife research, there there's a lot of discussion about, you know, the, the broad subject of, for instance, compassionate conservation, which one of the found fundamental points is that all animals are individuals. Um, and when we start talking about dogs in therapy, and, and again, I'm using the example of dogs because I am most familiar with them, though I imagine this is probably transferable to many other species, Um they're highly individualized. So if we're talking about studies, you know, I could take two of my dogs, or let's say three even. I've got Monster and Pigeon, who are both little terrier mixes, and they love to play. They love to cuddle. You know, like they're the ones I have to move when I get into bed at night and then kick you all night long. Um, and if you're sitting on the couch, they're sitting with you. They're bringing a toy to you. Uh, they've They've got high toy drive, high prey drive. Um, and just are generally a lot of fun, sort of in that regard. And then there's JJ, who's, uh, you know, my my first, uh, uh, or my dog, as my wife says. Um, and she is most often aloof. Um, she is, and I say unhappy, but not sad or depressed. She's just kind of like uh, Eeyore, in a way. Um, she yeah. likes to be around me, but she doesn't like to cuddle. Um, she doesn't like to play by with the way, me. By the way, you're, you're, descri you're describing my cat Tilly. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> she is, she's kind of cat like, um, yeah. and you know what I mean? Like she, she loves getting in the water and going for a swim, but she doesn't want to chase the ball. Um, she just, she just likes to be around me, but doesn't want to necessarily interact all the time. So if I were to take part in one of these studies and say, you know, report on how you feel with your dogs. Well, I feel comfort with JJ around. She's sort of like an old friend to me. But she does not provide the stimulation. She does not provide the the comfort necessarily that these other two dogs do, who who have this this desire, outward desire to to spend time with me, to to play with me, to cuddle with me. So the individual dogs just in my home have such a wide range. I would imagine that when we then start looking at this, even in one of the the larger studies, uh, you know, is it possible even to take into account the personality of the animal in question? Well, I think that's just a terrific question. And um, this, this it's very germane because I reviewed a research proposal just yesterday and I pointed out that same problem in my uh, sort of comments on the proposal. And uh, this was a case where they're going to use uh, a therapy dog to look at how the uh, presence of the dog and therapeutic situations uh, enhance the rapport between the therapist and the client, and they, it was a, a pretty good study in many in many ways. But they, I think they're going to they're going to use the same dog. In this case, it was the same dog, and uh, was, you know quite a quite a substantial number. And uh, my comment was, well, what's the dog going to be doing? Like, there's going to be some even though this is a this was a therapy dog, you know, it's going to be in a, you know, close to a hundred of these therapeutic situations. And sometimes it might be tired and it just might sit in a corner. Sometimes it might be in a, you know, you know, great mood and put its head on the client's lap. So, uh, and I think your point about the, you know, different animals is, is absolutely on the mark. We wouldn't expect, uh, you know, all animals to have to have the same effect. Similarly, we would anticipate that some people, that, that some people are animal people and they're going to completely perk up having that dog in the situation well other people are not so for example i am an animal person and i think i might you know that you know, having that dog there might benefit me on the other hand basically my wife is much less so and perhaps not so she might feel decidedly uncomfortable with the strange animal in the room and uh one of the one of the uh, new developments in the field that i think is very positive is that uh researchers in this area are now starting to take these individual differences on the human side uh, into account. And they're looking at people that have different types of attachment styles 
uh, with animals. And it appears to be the case that people who uh, benefit from uh, that, well, it appears to be the case that some people, some people benefit from having a, a therapy animal in the room or in the presence of a therapy dog, and some people don't. And it has to do with uh, their their comfort with animals and how much they they, they care they care about pets and including their own experiences with pets. So I think you're exactly right. That's one of the problems with research in this area. In this area, you know, those drugs. One of the nice things about those drug studies is that you know if you're given you know 15 milligrams of drug X to patients in the experimental group and a placebo in the control group, you have precise control over uh, at least the drug part, mm-hmm. but you don't in terms of what the animal's doing, the animal's personality, and then the individual differences in terms of its behavior from day to day, time, from time to time. So yeah, I completely agree with you. So what what's very curious to me now, as we talk about this, as you know, I, I read through many of your, your blogs in psychologytoday.com. Um, I've read your book many, many times. Uh, we've talked about your book before. Is I get this feeling that, and, and this is as a, a, Outsider to the scientific world, I get this uncomfortable feeling that there is a significant amount we don't know, and that many times when we ask questions, we don't get answers. And especially in the realm, and again, when we're talking pharmaceuticals, which you destroyed for me, um, <laughs> and you know, we we expect that yes, the result is it's 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 a, a an analog result, right? Like it either worked or it didn't work. Um, but as we start asking these questions, we're seeing that it's not that simple. Why do you think as a society, and I, and I say a society based on my, my limited views, um, that we expect animals to have these impacts on us, um, both from, again, you know, my recognition that going out back and throwing the ball with the dogs relieves stress for me in the afternoon after a tough day through to having a dog in my home will will fix my loneliness will relieve my you know my anxiety disorder my PTSD will will do all of these other things for me what what's causing us to sort of take this leap of faith almost in animals well i think there's uh two things that are going on one is that um you know we're we're a, in some ways we're a country of animal lovers i'm sure that's true in canada i'm sure that's true in the united states yeah People, if they love animals, most people say, yeah, you know, 60%, two-thirds of American homes are probably similar in Canada, you know, you know, include an animal. More and more people are thinking of their animals as as family members. So, you know, we we like we, you know, we like animals and we know that it's fun to play with them. And uh, especially when we're again, we're talking about dogs, dogs more than anything else. We have more research on that. Is uh, you know, they oftentimes give us, you know, the warm and fuzzies and they give us feedback and we can communicate with them and they in some ways they understand us at, a, at an amazingly deep level in terms of interspecific friendships. The other thing, however, is also uh, the media and the pet products industry. And um, the media is people like this idea and the media likes to feed into it. And um, the coverage uh, in the media uh even in you know even in research oriented media is oftentimes very slanted and it only ta- they only talk about the positive studies they omit the negative studies let me give you some examples of some negative stu- some studies that did not find an effect okay this i wrote a blog uh, I, I wrote a blog post on this recently so i just have and this I, I looked at some literature these were all studies that came out within the last year and got absolutely no press in the media uh, uh, one study found uh, horse therapy was no more effective than learning to ski. They had a control group. <laughs> the control group learned to ski. Uh, another study found that visits from a therapy dog did not alleviate pain and fear in children in hospitals. Uh, another study found dog walkers, who, people who walked their dogs, had more bad mental health days. Uh, another one found women who walked dogs actually got less total exercise than women that did not. Uh, testify. And then there was a review of 11 studies which found that interacting with animals had no effect on depression or mental health of the elderly people in nursing homes. Well, none of those none of those studies were reported in the press. And I remember when I was looking for a, a literary agent uh, for my book, uh, 
I talked to at length to a woman who was a high profile uh, New York mover and shaker in the publishing world. And, uh, you know, I explained to her what I was going to be writing about in my book. And and uh, she was, you know, she was, you know, encouraging. And I said, oh, and I'm going to I'll have, I'm going to have a chapter on the animal use of animals as therapist. And, you know, for example, did you know that there's actually no evidence that dolphins make good therapists? And uh, she said there was a long pause. And she said, well, nobody wants to read about that. <laughs> and, and she did not wind up being my literary agent. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, th- I think part of it's that. And then the pet products industry uh, is a trade group and they put out press releases, uh, you know, on the effectiveness of animals as pets. They uh, uh, push the idea that uh, if everybody gets a pet, it will save uh, enor- millions of dollars in the United States on health care costs, which is uh, not true. Um and uh, so then there's now there's now this industry uh, pushing pet ownership because of health health benefit health and psychological benefits. You know the idea that if you get a pet, your kid's going to be uh, uh, smarter, less shy, more empathetic. Um, there's not much good evidence for that. So there's a couple factors uh, pushing this idea, but there, but there's definitely some mismatch between what the public thinks we know and what we actually know. Well, and that's that's also you know through my experience with uh, uh, the wildlife side of things, um, learning what we don't know is, is equally, if not sometimes, more important when it comes to research. Um, like disproving it is a, a significant part of the long term study of anything. Oh, I think I think it's critical. And my my biggest concern right now, my absolute biggest concern, and it's not just in animals, animal stuff. It's also in psychology generally. And this is not just true of me. It's true of a lot of people is the whole bastion of what we know is based on studies that work. So uh, researchers typically do not uh, uh, submit their uh, negative results for publication. Uh, journals are somewhat less likely to uh, publish research showing negative results. So um, right now, what we have is a, if you look at the literature on uh, animal assisted therapy, it's the literature of studies that worked. And, and I've talked with researchers about this and said, why didn't you, I've, I've said like, well, all right, your study, you know, what happened with, what happened with the kids in the cat group? you know, that you studied. You, yeah, yeah, you published stuff on the kids that had the dogs. You know, they did have some benefits. What about the cat group? Uh, we didn't publish that. Uh, why not? Well, they were worse. They were worse off. No, I don't think cats made them worse off, but the, at least I think they should have published it. If you publish the positive stuff on the dogs, you should have published the negative stuff on the cats. Another study I saw recently was on dog walking, uh, and it was on the use of the uh, the uh, internet reminders to get people to walk their dogs, and uh, but it also had a component where they looked at dog walking on psychological and physical health. And uh, I looked at their research report, and they they only had the stuff on on the uh, email messages to get people to walk their dogs, and that was successful. You know, if you got regular email messages, you're more likely to walk your dog. But they didn't publish the second part, which in which they actually found that walking your dog more had no impact whatsoever on any physical measures, on body mass index, or psychological health. And they just happened to have conveniently left that out. Well, to me, what we have is this very biased set of literature showing that dog walking is good for people. And it's not completely biased because there's some researchers that are publishing their neg- that have started publishing their negative results. But you're quite right. Negative results are just as important or more important as positive results. And it just drives me crazy when we have high-quality studies, good studies, which find uh, you know, AAT and animal assist therapy doesn't work or the pet owners you know, are no better off. Those studies don't get published. And then when, if they do get published, they get ignored by the press and they get ignored by researchers in their lit reviews when they do their lit reviews for their journal articles. Really? Yeah. Cause that is, isn't that like sort of the most important part to sort of say what else has happened? I think it is. And I see that I do a lot of reviewing. Yeah. As you might expect, I do a lot of reviewing for, uh, for journals uh, in, on this topic. And I often see a statement like it is now well established that pet ownership provides blah, 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 positive impacts on blah, 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 blah. Or it's now well established that animal assisted therapy is effective for blah, blah, blah. And then they'll cite, you know, 10 studies, all of which were successful, and they will ignore the studies which found either negative results or no differences. And I, you know, of course, I point that out and say, no, you can't publish this the way it is. You need to go back and, you know, make that a more balanced lit review. But but I see this absolutely all the time. In fact, there was a paper that it wasn't, it was a paper that I 
just saw this morning. Um, that was published in a, in a uh, journal by the American Psychological Association on the impacts of pet therapy. And they did exactly that. All they did was have the glowing glowing studies and some anecdotes. Well, and that's, uh, I mean, that to me sort of just ruins the whole process. If, if you only look at positives, I mean, cherry picking, again, it's one of those very obvious issues in research that's very easily solved. Um, but I've, I've got two things to sort of end on. The The first is our preconceived notions. Um, this, I think, you, you illustrated beautifully by proving me completely wrong about my preconceived notions of the pharmaceutical <laughs> industry. Um, while well, I, I hate I, to burst the bubble on that, but I'm right about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and that's one of those ones where it's like, you know, you kind of back your mind, you know, there's a lot of greed and there's a lot of probably greased bombs, but you still assume uh, that they're going to be doing all of this. Because, um, of course, money never made anyone do bad things. Um, and <laughs> But that also plays in, I think, in the opposite way, because in an email uh, when we were discussing our interview, um, you mentioned that you got a copy of a journal article showing that crickets can make great therapy animals. Uh, and that to me, yeah. no, because people eat crickets when they're covered in chocolate and they make weird noises and the dogs chase them in the backyard. Um, so is this maybe one of those situations where our preconceived notions or our existing bias about certain things can completely blind us to something that may be right in front of us? Absolutely. And the thing about the cricket study, I'm getting ready to write about it now, is that the cricket study was really well done. All those things that I complained about before, they they had a big sample size. They had a really good control group. They had it was a it was a randomized control trial. You know, they randomly assigned people and they gave them what they did was they these were elderly people, relatively healthy people in Korea. Uh, each person was given a cage with five with five. Yeah, you know, the, the experimental group was given a cage with five crickets uh, to keep uh, as as pets for for eight weeks. Uh, the control group uh, did not get crickets. Both groups uh, evolved regularly for the same amount of time. So they had they had some you know, the same sorts of interactions with with humans. Uh, and they did. I thought they did everything right. Uh, and what they did was they found that the people uh, that these people that had the crickets for eight weeks were less depressed. They, they actually had some slight improvements in their significant improvements in their cognitive skills and some uh, factors associated with everyday living. Now, the interesting thing is that they also looked at some other variables and they found that there were no differences. For example, they looked at some physiological indicators of stress and they reported very clearly that the crickets did not affect these physiological indicators. So uh, first of all, uh, they had they they covered a lot of the methodological problems that I see. And then they also were very good about reporting all the results, the negative results and the positive results. So I, I loved it. I loved the study. It was great. And I, I you know, crickets. What are you going to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that really does kind of make you question everything. Because if a cricket can, or five crickets, uh, can alter your mood um, over the course of eight weeks, and it's 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 provable, um, it really makes you stop and wonder, like, you know, both in terms of how we, we view our own mood and the things that affect our mood, and also, you know, general uncomfortable life questions at that point. Um, so it's, I just, that's brilliant that they, they managed to show this. Uh, of course, I, I would imagine the questions then come up of, um, is it the crickets themselves that are causing this or is it having something to focus on? Perhaps is it? Oh, oh yes. I think that's exactly correct. And I suspect strongly that it, I think having fo something to focus on and I think, and I think, uh, my, uh, my friend and colleague, Alan Beck, uh, who's been this field for a long, long time, one of the founders of the field, he says that uh, a lot of the benefits we have from interacting uh, comes from focusing on something uh, other than yourself. And these people had to take daily care of these crickets. You know, they didn't just, just sit there. They had detailed instructions on what to do. And um, but uh, the other thing is, I don't, I don't believe single studies anymore. So I think this is a very cool study. But uh, I'm not about to go out and get, my, get myself five crickets. Because I'd like to see a different research team actually replicate this, and they gave enough detail in this report, research report, um, that you could replicate it. So I, 
I'd like to see it replicated before I become a, a complete true believer. Mm -hmm. um, but at least I thought it was the kind of research that I'd like to see more of. Well, and I'd personally like to see you running around the fields trying to catch five crickets. Um, I feel that would improve <laughs> my mood. So, uh, but what I'd like to end on, this is a question that I've been thinking about. Um, and as I was reading your blogs kept coming up, not oh, throwing my pen, um, is, and as I've said, you know, I'll, during my day, I'll take time and I'll go and I'll, I'll throw the ball for some of the dogs, go for a walk, I'll do all of those different things. And I know it's improving my mood. It's relieving stress in part because I'm doing something active. I'm walking away from the thing that is causing me stress. Um, and I also know that, you know, the relationship with these dogs is, is beneficial to me in that um, it is, you know, uh, 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 I can't think of the term anymore. It, it's, benef it's mutually beneficial. Um you know, there is love, there is affection. Um, but I also know that it can't replace the the pharmacological intervention that I have. Uh, it can't replace the therapy program I'm in. So how do we address this in such a way that, you know, for me, the dogs are beneficial. They help me. Um, and I think sometimes I help them. But there's also limitations to what that relationship can do, particularly in regard to mental health, where, you know, at times we end up talking life or death. We end up talking success or failure in a very big way. Uh, how do we approach that and say, like, yes, but... Well, I don't have a, I don't have a, uh, a, a clean answer for that. And I'm, I'm sort of... My guess is that you and I are pretty much in the same place about it. So... You know, for example, um, you know, I've got my cat, my cat Tilly, you know, our cat Tilly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know I know what I know what the data says and how limited it is in terms of, of uh, you know, the impact of the animals on loneliness and things like that. But yet, you know, when my wife's away, you know, she's off at a meeting or something like that or, you know, is away, you know, visiting someone for, for a week or so, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's me and the cat. And I get great comfort for having the, for having that cat around, even though she's not yeah. as warm and fuzzy as is is a is a is a is a dog. But you know, I get a lot of comfort and satisfaction out of her coming over and you know sitting in my lap sometime, or if I'm laying down laying down in bed, and getting ready to go to go to sleep. You know, we'll sit there and watch a cat videos cat videos you know for a little while together. You know, which they do make uh, videos for cats, which are pretty fun. And uh, the other thing that I've learned that uh, she enjoys is uh, watching uh, BBC, uh, the BBC uh, nature shows. Mm. She likes watching the animals. So we can sit around together and watch and watch animal shows on television. And, um, and I definitely feel like uh, she's good for my mental health. So I, you know, again, this is my own, my, my, my subjective, you know, how Herzog, the, the person as opposed to Hal Herzog, the, uh, you know, tough, tough minded, as it were, you know, cynical researcher, uh, that's, 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 uh, you know, has high, you know, hopefully high standards for what I consider, uh, you know, clinical evidence. There's a, there's a mismatch between that and my, in my own self. So I don't really have a, a, a good answer to your question, but I think you're, uh, raising exactly the right question the, the, you're raising the deeper question. You know, what are the limits of science um, and what, what do we trust? Do we trust our our own intuition, our own beliefs, our own experience? Or do we trust, uh, you know, the numbers, the numbers from a, a scientific study? Well, and that might be the question that we need to, to bring up in that therapeutic uh, environment. Um, you know, that's something I have found uh, and I, I am a strong proponent of, of trying different types of therapy, sure. uh, particularly with, with a professional. Um, because I know there's, and this, it, it, it upsets me greatly the amount of stigma that exists around that going and asking for help from a professional, but that's the kind of thing that a therapist can help you work through is, you know, is this helping me? Is it enough to help me? Um, it's, it's sort of helping you ask those questions and, and providing you, the sounding board to develop some insight into it so you can recognize that yes you know walking the dogs playing with the dogs watching the cat videos helps but you also need to be doing xyz yes yeah i think that's exactly right 
Dr. Herzog's articles appear regularly on psychologytoday.com, and his wonderful book, Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat, can be found anywhere books are sold. While what we learn today shows that maybe cats, dogs, and other pets aren't providing us with any remarkable boost to our mental health, we always benefit when we experience and express love and compassion. Please take time to say hello to your furry, scaly, or feathery family member for me and post a picture with them on the Everyday Fray podcast social media feeds at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for joining the show this week. This is the Everyday Fray. I'm Michael Howie, and my journey is far from over.